What do you have to lose right now? I just think people are scared of fail. Being able to understand what it means to have to wait, to be patient. You're listening to the Yash and Company Podcast. Hey everyone, this is Yashanka Chalasani, or otherwise known as Yash, and you are listening to the Yash and Company Podcast. And this is a show where we're joined by extraordinary young adults. I'm talking people on the Forbes 30 under 30 list, professional athletes, or as we have on today's show, my good friend Marcus Stroud, who's a 25-year-old that has started a $50 million venture capital fund. And before we hear from Marcus, I just want to say thank you for supporting the work that we do here with the podcast. Um, there are actually some really exciting things that we have planned. And one of them I want to share with you all is that we're actually launching a website in the coming days. Uh, on that website, there's going to be some free gear and some free giveaways. So uh, stay on the lookout for that. And if you want to stay connected with me, or honestly, the best way to stay connected with the podcast, the way to do that right now is to follow me on Instagram. My Instagram username is oh my underscore yash. And if you follow me, you know that I actually post some behind the scenes stuff uh, with the recordings that I do, you'll actually be able to see who I'm recording with a few weeks or maybe even a month before the podcast gets out. So that's probably the best way. And if you already haven't, go ahead and subscribe and follow the podcast. And if you really like what you hear, do give us a rating as well. So as you all know, it's officially spring and that means it's time to get outside and finally enjoy some good weather. I'm sure some of y'all have actually started seeing some hammocks around town and maybe even thought about getting one yourself. Maybe you heard of Inu or some of these other companies, but paying over $100 for a hammock and straps, that's ridiculous. That's what I want to tell you about the best hammock I've ever tried. It's made from our friends at Octopus Outfitters, a company that was actually started by a college student at Baylor, and these guys are the real deal. They make hammocks that are sturdier than Inu for half the price. And here's the kicker. They come with all the major parts like tree straps already included, so you don't have to pay extra. I don't know of any other brand that's doing that. Octopus is actually extending a special offer for our listeners. So go to octopusoutfitters.com and use the code YASH to get 15% off your purchase. And as we always do on the show, here is a short intro about my good friend, Marcus Stroud. Marcus Stroud was raised in the small town of Prosper, Texas. Marcus actually accepted an offer to play football at Princeton University, where he received his bachelor's in religion. Here, he wrote his thesis on a historical analysis of American religious and cultural trends in the 20th and 21st century. After Princeton, Marcus cut his teeth on Wall Street, where he was a fixed income analyst at the largest and leading fixed income electronic trading platform company for institutional investors and dealers. Marcus then left Wall Street to join Vita Capital in Austin, Texas, a multi-billion dollar alternative asset manager. After Vita, Marcus was recruited to lead the Clubhouse Investment Club, a conglomerate of celebrity investors looking to co-invest with top-tier VCs. Marcus sourced deals, conducted due diligence, circulated investment opportunities, and raised funds for individual deals. At TVXV, Marcus will focus on fundraising and deal sourcing, with a particular focus on consumer deals. So this recording has probably been one of my favorite ones to date. Here, Marcus gets real. He talks about the adversity that he faced as a kid and how it was like for him to actually grow up under the wings of baseball legend Tory Hunter. He also dives into how he started a fund, what prompted him to do so in the first place, and the actual pitch he gives investors when he walks in that room. But some of the gems from this episode that I've loved include the advice he got from Jeff Bezos, how he found his own form of meditation, and how he handles the pressure he has on himself every single day. So without further ado, here's my long form conversation with Marcus Stroud. So I'm in Dallas, Texas, recording this episode with Mr. Marcus Stroud. And I'm really excited for this episode because um, I had a ton of input from you guys. So on my Instagram, I actually posted a uh, poll where, you know, y'all could ask questions and I got a ton of them for uh, Marcus. And so I'll be uh, definitely be including some of those in this. Um, but one of the texts that I got that week before I was, rec- when people found out I was recording with him was a, uh, old friend of Marcus that, uh, went to high school with him. And, uh, this is what he had to say. I thought it'd be a good place to start. He said he was always a super nice guy. Even when he was a big man on campus, everybody knew him because he was such a beast on the football field, but so nice to everybody. I never heard one bad thing about him. Some of the older football players got into some big time trouble when I was a freshman, but he wasn't involved in any of it. He's a great guy. So, uh, Marcus, uh, these are some uh, pretty high words for you. Yeah, man. Holy cow. Wow. I'm, I'm truly humbled and honored by that. Holy cow. Yeah. So, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Really, really pumped to be doing this. Yeah. So, um, it was funny because we were actually talking about this uh, a little bit earlier, and we were mentioning how you have two sides of you. You have the uh, super nice guy, 
um, that everyone knows, but you also have the football player in you where mm-hmm. you just kind of let loose. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about how, um, as a, uh, guy that has started a venture capital fund, you've actually found the, uh, the football side of you start coming back. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, for sure, man. Yeah. It's, it's crazy, man. It's like my whole life. I've always been really competitive, but I've also always tried to be, um, as I guess Christ-like as possible is the best way. Cause I am a strong believer. Faith is very important to me and I'm very open about that. Uh, and so I was very fortunate to, you know, grow up in a town where we had a lot of great football players and then went to a college that was extremely competitive and had some great teammates. But, um, I've always wanted to make sure I was treating people the way I want to be treated. But it's like when I started TXV or when I just got like seriously, you know, involved in business in which I wasn't just an analyst or an associate or firm anymore, but I was actually the guy sourcing the investments or the guy making the investment decisions. I learned really quickly when my name is on something, just like in football, when I have a certain responsibility, I am super detail oriented and I am super, super, super like just, you know, aggressive about it. I'm all about let's get this thing done. Let's do what we have to do. Relentless is probably the best word to put it. And so, yeah, man, I've seen that football side of me come out in a way that I didn't think would come out this early in my career. Sure. But it's been super awesome. Yeah, I love that about sports because um, I think that's the best part, right? Is, you know, you, you play sports when you're in high school because, you know, yes, it's fun, but those skills translate way beyond the football field. For me, it was a tennis court. And For sure. that's what it's all about. For sure. Um, so, you know, you mentioned a lot of different stuff there, and I want yeah. to definitely dive into a little bit of, of all of that. Um, so, but I thought a good place to start would be your upbringing. So, yeah. Um, your dad was a pro football player, yep. right? Yep. And um, so when you grew up, did you have dreams of playing pro ball yourself? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So my father, actually, he did play in the NFL, but he actually wasn't in my life. Um, you know, after a certain po- point, just just didn't work out for him. He had some stuff going on. And so uh, I still always thought it was really cool they played in the NFL. And then when you grow up in a place like Texas, football is always all around you. And, you know, especially you grew up in, you know, very compa- a very competitive part of, you know, Dallas. And, you know, you grew up around so many great football players. And so, yeah, to answer your question, I had so many dreams of playing in the NFL. I saw myself every day wearing the, the blue and silver uh, playing for the Cowboys. But, you know, it just didn't work out that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think you mentioned a little bit of this. And it, one thing when I think back about um, anyone's childhood is that there is some form of adversity. That they for face. sure. And, uh, the greatest part about adversity is that it shapes you into who you are today. I right? agree completely. So, uh, what was that adversity like that you faced when you were, uh, growing yeah. up? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I had a single mother and, and two younger brothers and, you know, my mom did a lot to make sure ends were met, were met. And, you know, we we're very fortunate and blessed to grow up in an affluent city like Prosper, uh, where we had the, the people, the resources to thrive, but that didn't necessarily mean like everything at home was good for us. So, I was very privileged and blessed to to live in a city with those type of people. And my senior year of high school, I was fortunate to be taken in by a baseball player by the name of Tori Hunter. And so Tori and his wife, Katrina, they dramatically changed my life in a million different ways. Um, they had three boys who were roughly around my age. And so I got really close. I've always been close with them. But, you know, Tori and Katrina took on more of a, you know, a guardian role, if you will. And you know, just them being there for me uh, and helping me and teaching me a lot about life. In addition to all the great things my mom did for my brothers and I, uh, just truly showed me that, you know, adversity sucks, but adversity is also privilege. And I've always lived by that mantra that adversity is privilege. Uh, I don't think there's any situation in life that you can't look at and be like, man, you know, something came from that. You know, so and that's just kind of always been my mindset. I've tried to look at every negative situation in my life as a positive in some regard, even if it's, you know, the faintest thing, uh, I don't know. This has always been my mindset. I think it's always been the thing that's kind of pushed me through those hard times. Yeah. I think, uh, whenever you talk to someone that's going through a tough time, um, I think, you know, when you know, someone that has their stuff together, when they are already conceptualizing that, you know, loss in the moment beyond exactly. that moment. Um, and so I can already tell like the way you're describing that, um, that, you know, even if something comes your way that you're going to be, you're going to be just fine. Oh yeah. So, uh, that's awesome. So, you know, when you were growing up with, um, the Hunter family, mm-hmm. um, what, what are some things that you learned from them? I think, uh, Tory Hunter was still playing baseball yeah. at the time, right? For sure. Yeah, he was, he was still dominating, still playing. Uh, man, I just learned what it was like to, you know, be in a, in a family that size. 
because, you know, it's, you know, Tori, his wife, they have three boys, but they also had a lot of cousins and a lot of friends that came through. And I just, I didn't have that growing up. It was my mom, my brothers and I, that's it. Uh, and so just being a large family and just seeing that, you know, many different dynamics of a family, uh, cause my brothers and myself are a lot of like, we're all more like more or less the same people. Um, but when you're dealing with so many different personalities and so many different people, it's just super cool. And, you know, you learn how conflict is handled in many different ways. You learn how, um, you know, people just, you know, go about their faith. You learn how people just go about life. And it's just, it was just so cool being in the household. And then, you know, you're living with one of the greatest center fielders of all time. So, you know, there are days where you come home with, with you know, with his boys and you see Gary Sheffield or Derek Jeter sitting on the couch. And that's just a casual thing. And, and so, I don't know, man. Those days I will always treasure because I've I learned so much just about life in general. I learned so much about, hey, Tory is financially one of the most successful baseball players of all time, but he was always the same person. He always gave back to the community. He always took care of his family. He always put his faith first. And he always made sure he's an extremely informed investor. And Tory was actually the person that taught me about uh, venture capital and private equity and got me into the, in, 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 intrigued my interest in getting into the world. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and definitely want to touch up on a lot of that. Yeah. But, uh, in the middle of that, before you started investing, you decided to go to Princeton. Yeah. So, uh, why Princeton? Yeah, man. So my dream school growing up was Stanford. I was that one kid in, in, in fifth grade and then sixth grade and seventh grade and all high school. You know, you got everybody rocking their Baylor and their A&M and their UT and, you know, these phenomenal schools with super awesome football programs and just, you know, just places that you want to be at. And then you got little old Marcus walking around with the Stanford Cardinal red on. And everybody was like, why do you want to go to Stanford, dude? And for me, uh, Stanford just epitomized so much. It was a great football program, great academics in beautiful California. You couldn't, it didn't get better than that in my eyes. So Stanford was my dream school. I was very fortunate to, to be recruited by Stanford, but Stanford didn't offer me. And so when Stanford didn't offer me, I remember I was in such a, a tough place. So I was like, wow, or what am I going to do now? My dream school didn't offer me. And I had some other, I had a good amount of offers, but that was my dream school. And then one day, uh, it's a, that, that's another long story, the whole recruiting story, but Princeton, you know, just revealed itself and, once Princeton offered, then some other Ivy League schools offered and took a visit at all the schools, and Princeton ended up being my choice. And, uh, yeah, I was proud to become a Princeton Tiger. Yeah, so were you, uh, went in high school, I'm assuming you were uh, very focused on your academics? Oh, yeah. I mean, with, with my mother, it was, there was no football unless it was academics first, you know. And so she didn't really care about how many tackles or sacks or, you know, touchdowns I'd have. She was all about, okay, what does your report card look like? What are you doing in these classes? How are your AP classes going? And, uh, you know, Tori was the same way. He was like, hey, man, how are, how are you guys doing with your grades? Uh, and so, I don't know. You know, football was always my favorite thing and my passion, but I knew that there was going to be a life beyond football at some point, so I had to take my academics super seriously. And I knew that I'm not a six foot four linebacker that's going to go play at Baylor or Texas, so I need to make sure my academics can get me into a school in the event that football does it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um- so when you go to Princeton, was that like a culture shock for you? Oh, yeah. In so many different ways, man. You know, you, you go to this school, you're from this little small town, you know, in Prosper that, you know, just became a 3A school for me and a 2A school for so long. And you got one restaurant and you got Sonic. I'm not even counting that as a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go to a place like Princeton, you know, this, 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 you know, storied university that, you know, you hear of in so many different places. And nobody there looks like you. Nobody there talks like you. Nobody there um, more or less has some of the views that you have. And you have to adjust and you have to, you know, you have to you have to learn, you have to grow. And so it was a huge culture shock from a faith perspective, from a, you know, just geography perspective and, and just from a culture perspective it was, you know, but, you know, it made me a much better person. Yeah. Did you feel like you were different from everyone else from the sense? Oh, yeah. Like- um, obviously, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit of that, but, sure. um, you know, can you talk a little bit more about yeah, your, for sure. just, just like how hard that was? Yeah, exactly. So you, you know, you go into a school like Princeton and you have, you know, these kids that are coming from Exeter and Deerfield and, and, and these you, are all prep, uh, and these are all prep schools, yeah. exactly. Prep schools on the East coast. And, and then you got a lot of kids from boarding schools in England and, and, and other places. And, 
they have been socialized to fit into a place as elitist as Princeton. And so for them, the whole eating club thing or the whole, you know, just nature of Princeton and the, and, and the preppiness that comes with it is just another transition in life that they're used to. Then you got this kid from Little Prosper who walks in there with some Air Force Ones, some, some cargo shorts and like a camo hoodie in his first lecture. <laughs> you know, you look a lot out of place. You know, you look a whole lot out of place. And, uh, you feel bad. You feel, you feel like, holy cow, I don't belong here. I already think I don't belong here in terms of, you know, grades and, and, and et cetera. But I really don't feel here when you see what these kids look like, what you see what they're wearing. And then when you, see, when you hear what their parents have done, you know, these kids weren't the kids of super famous athletes or, you know, regular, these are kids of, of, of politicians and, 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 you know, Wall Street titans. And so you're just like, what am I doing here? I don't deserve to be here. And you just have this feeling of, I don't know, of just like, you know, n- neglect that you don't deserve to be a part of that, a, a place as cool as that. So, so did uh, you like, uh, did you see yourself, uh, as you kind of reflect on that time, by the time you got out, did you see yourself mold into maybe part of that culture? I would say yes. To answer that question, you definitely become socialized in some ways, even if you don't realize it, uh, you know, at, by virtue of being a Princetonian. But I think the reason I was able to make so many good friends and the uh, the reason that I feel as though I had a lot of meaningful relationships, not only with students, but with a lot of professors is because I always stayed who I was. Uh, you know, the joke around campus, especially with the football team was, there he is, Mr. Prosper, Texas, because I was very proud to say where I was from. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you are, you know, the culmination of your upbringing. And so, I wasn't just going to flip the switch just because I became in an eating club. I just got this internship with this super awesome Wall Street firm. Uh, I was always going to be who I was, that same kid from Little Prosper that, you know, was working three or four jobs, you know, his junior and sophomore summer um, in that, you know, hot Texas heat. I was always going to keep that in the back of my mind because I knew that would carry me much, much further in life than just, you know, adapting to whatever Princeton wanted me to be. Sure. So... <clears throat> So college finishes up yeah. and you decide to go to Wall Street. Yeah. But you actually don't stick there very long. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love to hear your take on what you picked up from Wall Street, right? Because yeah. in my mind, you know, I, I think of investment banking. I think of um, obviously the stock market exactly. and all these things. That just, I just think of fi- the finance hub. Yeah. And you were in the heart of it. So yeah. what did you um, what did you think going in and uh, what were your thoughts kind of coming out? Yeah. Like I said, I intern at a firm in New York. And then all of my friends were investment bankers or traders. Uh, and so I knew a lot about the culture. I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew the long hours I was getting myself into. Um, but I was so fired up for that because that's what I wanted. I knew I wanted to be in finance. And so just being able to work at a firm in New York that it was the largest, uh, you know, electronic trading platform for, you know, corporate debt. And so just being able to be at a firm like that and you're talking to some of the largest sell side firms and, and, and banks in the world and heads of those desks at said banks. And then you're talking to some of the largest buy side firms like the KKRs, like the PIMCOs, like the Black Rocks. And you're, you're literally an analyst. It's just, you know, it was one of a kind of experience. And trust me, the hours were terrible. Um, the, the mornings were, were tough. But it just it just molded you and it just made you so fired up to be doing what you were doing every day. So what kind of made you want to leave that place? Yeah, for sure. I think for me, Princeton in a lot of ways, it forces you to fit within a certain bubble. And so and in this case with so many schools, I've learned that it's probably the case with Baylor. It's the case, you know, with a lot of schools. And what people do is they they take the traditional route. You go do investment banking or consulting. You do that for two years or three years, and then you go into the next role for two or three years, and then you do that. And I remember sitting at my desk one morning. I was in, I got there really really early. It was probably like five fifteen five thirty, and I was just sitting there looking at my computer screen. I had Bloomberg pulled up, and I'm like, Marcus, you literally see your life flashing before your eyes. You're going to be in New York for five years. You're going to be in Market Access, the firm I was at for probably another year and a half. And I was going to go try to be in a P or a hedge fund. And I'm going to be in New York for literally five years. And I'm going to be just like everybody else. And I'm not going to do anything crazy, but I've been extremely blessed to have a life that wasn't 
like everybody else's. You know, I grew up with very little, but then I ended up, you know, living with this incredible person named Tori Hunter and his wife. And then I go to this school that I had no business getting into. And now I have an incredible job. So what else is there out in life I can take advantage of right now uh, that other people aren't really trying to take advantage of? So for me, I was like the 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 way for mobility in New York City is just so hard because you have so many people that look like you who are doing what you're doing, who have the same pedigree you have. Um, so it's really, really hard to get out of fun. But I knew if I went back home or somewhere in a much smaller market, it may be a lot easier to get into a fund. So that morning, I started researching funds in Austin and Dallas and in Texas in general, because I want to be back in Texas. Uh, just I mean, plus your money goes so much further in Texas than it does anywhere else. You know, it's like <laughs> you're young, you want to save some money. Like, you know, the taxes in New York are kicking your butt. But I just started researching funds in Texas. and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try to work at this hedge fund in Austin. I am so underqualified. I do not have the experience requirements, but I'm just going to try to work at the fund because I want to accelerate my career. And so that's that's how I ended up back in Texas and why I left Wall Street, if you will. Sure. So um, is there anything that as you look back at Wall Street that you kind of miss? Yeah. The camaraderie, uh, all the analysts, you're going through that nasty grind together. The, you know, the Q1 edits before you sit on all the presentations that you have to do together as a team. The late nights, you're sitting in the office and everybody's, you know, Uber Eats. They're literally ordering so much food off Uber Eats on the firm. You're just sitting there just laughing being like, what is my life right now? Or the super, super early mornings and you and the fellow analysts are walking down the street to get like a, a bagel or some breakfast sandwich. And you're just like, it's so cold. And I remember every morning I took a subway from lower Manhattan to Grand Central, because that's where my office was, was right outside of Grand Central, because a lot of the Wall Street firms started to make their way to Midtown in New York. And every morning, it was incredibly cold. And there was this nasty smell of kimchi on the subway every single morning. <laughs> and I just remember being like, oh, my gosh, my paychecks are getting taxed at this percent. I wake up every morning, I go on this disgusting subway that smells like kimchi. And I live with four of my teammates from college in, in, a, in a really cool apartment. But we, the thing in New York is you put up temporary walls to create bedrooms. So a two bedroom apartment that's maybe a thousand square feet, you put up temporary walls. And that's just the thing that people do in New York City because it's just so expensive. So my bedroom was temporary walls, but I didn't have any outlets. So we had literally a freaking, uh, strip running outside in the hallway between the rooms. And we, uh, you know, we use that when you hit this, when you hit the strip, all the lamps would turn at the same time and off. So if one of my roommates wanted to be, you know, like reading a book and one of the light on, then our lights oh, had to be no. apart. Like, yeah. It was terrible, man. It was absolutely terrible. And I don't know why we didn't think of a, you know, more ingenious way to, 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 to do that, but like it's just what it was. And I just said, okay, enough is enough. But I do miss those, those, those nights and those moments and that weird little strip and that freaking temporary wall. It was, uh, it definitely built some character. Sure. Yeah. Um, so when you come to Austin, yeah. you, uh, within a few months, uh, so I'm looking at your LinkedIn right now. So in 2017, you come to Vita Capital and you stop that job in January of 2018, but you start TXV Partners in November of 2017. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, you, you, you come to Texas, you start, you start working for this fund, but in your mind, maybe you've already had an idea for uh, TXV. Yeah. So when, as I'm leaving New York, I'm thinking to myself, at some point in the next five years, I'm going to start my own fund. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to start my own fund. So why, wh where did that come from? <sighs> that was a dream of mine in college. So uh, my co-founder, Brandon, and I, we both were at so many lectures in college, in which we'd have really cool folks come to campus. And one of the lectures we had, we had a few VCs speaking on venture capital and private equity. And I thought that was just so incredibly cool. I was like, holy cow, this is super awesome. But I started doing research on like really like well-known Princeton alum. And one of the alums that really resonated with me was a guy named John Rogers Jr. He founded Aerial Investments. It's a very, very, very large firm. Uh, you know, it's about $22.5 billion in assets. And John Rogers Jr. was a great basketball player at Princeton, uh, sits on the board of Nike, very close friends with the Obamas, was just a really accomplished man. And he started his first, he started Aerial right out of undergraduate with a few thousand dollars and built it up. And to see the impact that he had, I'm like, wow, it's super awesome. And then when you walk those halls and you think of the people that walk those halls, like Jeff Bezos and Meg Whitman, 
uh, and Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. <laughs> and there's all these really cool, you know, presidents and other people who I'm forgetting right now. Eric Schmidt. You're just like, why can't I do something crazy? You know, I remember one night we were all watching the social network in our room. And you're watching this, this movie. And you see all these nerds at Harvard sitting in the dorm. Mark Zuckerberg and the folks that are playing these other characters, the, the Winkle Boss twins, all that. And you're like, these nerds had an idea. And, and they, they, they took it. And look what Facebook is today. Why can't we do something like that? You know, we're, we're those same nerds. When I sit at Harvard, we're sitting at Princeton, the better school. <laughs> we're, we're those same nerds. And we're literally sitting in this room. Why can't we do something crazy? Uh, so, yeah, we don't want to do it right away. But we knew we wanted to do it pretty early. Yeah, I think what's really funny about that is... Um and I'm sure this is the case for you is, you know, the same people that you've had those conversations with, like, I bet they're all probably in wall street or yeah. doing some of the same jobs that they oh, yeah. at college. And, um, you know, I'm looking at you, you know, you got 25 years old, you got a fund of your own. That's uh, it's, a, it's, uh, it's crazy what, um, a little bit of perseverance and inspiration and, uh, you know, just taking that first step to exactly, what you want to do and uh, where that can lead you. So, um, is there anything that has really prepped you for your experience at TXV? Yeah. So I was at, let's see, I was at, you know, I was in New York for about a year and then I was at Vita Capital for a little under a year. Um, right after I left Vita, I actually took over Tory, one of Tory's investment vehicles. It was called the Clubhouse Investment Club. And it was a, you know, it's not on my LinkedIn because we just kind of morphed it into TXV and what it is. Uh, and so that's when I, that's what I left from Vita. So Tory had actually called me and said, hey, man, you know how I created this club. He created this really cool syndicate called the Clubhouse Investment Club. And it had the likes of David Ortiz and all these really cool athletes and baseball players who more or less were investing in venture now. And they were looking at a lot of assets, real estate, venture, PE, some other stuff. But uh, the premise was definitely early stage seed and series eight venture. And, uh, you know, when I did that, Tori said, hey, I want you to be the guy. I want you to be sourcing the deals. I want you to be constructing the deals. I want you to be doing the deals on the deals. And I want you to bring them to us. And you were doing this while you were at Vita? This is right after I left Vita. Okay. So this is this is what you see when you says November 2017th for TXV. That was like the first iteration of TXV. It was the, it. That, that, that syndicate, if you will. And so I'm literally creating these deals. I'm like thrown into the fire. I have like a few weeks prep by some of the, the folks that were helping get this thing together in terms of, hey, this is the type of deals to look for, but go find deal flow. So I was very fortunate in that being thrown to the fire, I had the backings of some of the most famous athletes in the world saying, hey, we, you have our capital and you can use our name again in these rooms. Uh, but like I said, I, I just networked you know really well and met a lot of the best investors on the coast in Silicon Valley and got access to a lot of great deal flow. They taught me a lot about diligence. They taught me a lot about sourcing. They taught me a lot about what to look for in certain startups, especially in the seed and series A companies, it's, you know, especially in the B2C play as well. And so um, just having that, that access to some of the best investors in the world at such a young age and being naive and them loving the fact that you're so naive was just so great because the more naive I was, the more they were like, Hey, I really want to help you because I want to see you succeed. So I just went in eyes like wide, just saying, Hey, teach me what you can. And I remember I was at Excel one day, you know, one of the top five funds in the world. And I'm sitting there talking to, you know, one of their partners and he's just saying, Hey, Marcus, this is what you look for in a deal. This is what you look for in a startup. This is what you look for in a founder. Uh, you know, this is the type of check size if I were you, I would write for a deal like this. And I'm just sitting there like, wow, I decided to take a risk in my life and I ended up right here as a result of that risk. Now, a lot of times that doesn't happen. Sometimes you just fall flat on your face and you don't know what you're doing. But I was fortunate that that's where life had taken me. And so I think that prepped me pretty well to begin to form TXV in its current iteration as, you know, what it is now. The company you're working for under Tory Hunter. Yeah. Um, that just morphed into TXV. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. So we just, Tory, and then they, they focused on their real estate and they kept those investments in, in the real estate. But we kind of took the model that we have with the venture and we just turned that thing into a fund. Got it. And so I just said, hey guys, I would love to just do this on my own. I want to build a fund. I love your support as LPs, as, as, as endorsers of portfolio companies in the future. But I just want your support to create a fund. And I spent, I'm telling you, man, I spent long, long, long nights studying fund formation. Cause it was a lot different than having a syndicate in which you can just call 50 super famous athletes for money being like, Hey, this is the deal we're going to do. Can you put capital in it? And 
and actually creating a firm where you have to have a culture, you have to have an investment strategy and a thesis, you have to have a full on team, you have to you have to have a full on back office, you have to have a great relationship with the accounting and the legal. And, you know, it was just a complete difference. And so just me like spending so many nights studying, you know, the TPGs and the Carlo groups was just, you know, really, really awesome and informative for me uh, in getting to XP where it is now. You threw out a ton of these terms and some of them I, I don't even know. So, yeah. so let's break some of those down. So syndicate is basically like, you know, all these uh, investors come together. They can and and they have the option exactly. to yeah, invest. It's basically like an angel group, right? Exactly. Um, and then uh, what you're talking about is a, uh, is a venture capital fund where exactly. the investors invest in a, in a fund, a pool, and it's, then you have the option to invest that how you like, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly it. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I got to ask, where did the name TXV come from? Yeah. So this is a really funny story, actually. So we were supposed to be Texas Venture Partners, TXV, Texas Venture Partners. Uh, Because our firm is TXV Partners. So when we were creating the name TXV Partners or Texas Venture Partners, we're sitting there with our legal legal team. We're being like, okay, we have the name, right? And like, we, for some reason, this, the domain isn't working. We can't get the name registered. Like somebody has a name. So we do a ton of research. We're like, we want this name. We want to be the Texas Venture Fund. Like, we want this name. (laughs) And, and we found out there's like, there's somebody, some like, really like, you know, remote guy in like West Texas that would not give the name up. I mean, we did a lot of diligence finding. He was like, I'm keeping this name. He didn't have any investments. He just, I'm keeping this name. And I was like, dude, really? Are you kidding me? You're really not going to give us his name, but we were like, whatever. And we just made a TXV. Uh, We were like, you know what? All the cool funds go by three letters, GGV, you know, TCV. We're just going to go by three letters, TXV. And it stuck. There you go. So at this point in your life, you've started the fund officially. Yeah. You're getting all this logistical stuff going. Yeah. Um, so at this point, are you still raising? You're still trying to raise money. Uh, yeah. We're, the fund is not yet closed. We have raised a great deal of capital, uh, but we have not closed the fund yet, just because there have been fortunately some just really awesome things that have happened that has you know changed the structure of the fund from being one size to a different size. And so it's just been really, really cool. Uh, but we've, we've, we've definitely raised a good amount of capital, have already started making some investments, uh, a good amount of investments, and we'll be making a good amount over the next few months until we have a full, full close. Yeah. So how difficult was that? Just like go through all those logistics and yeah. um, working with the, the big brother of the regulation world, the SEC. Like yeah. how, how was that? Man, it was, it was incredibly hard because people, see you walk in a room. So I would say not, not as much as me. You know, I think for me, because I played football, I've always been told I look a little bit older. Also, people didn't really think I was as young as I actually am, but like my other partners, they do look like our age. And so when we walk in a room, people be like, what in the world? What do what do you, what do you, we're, we're trying to make TXV. Are you guys TXV? Right. Are you all the like, analysts? Or the yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we're like, yeah. And they're like, what? And we didn't get taken seriously by, you know, very many people in the beginning. And so that was really hard. And then there were just so many things that we didn't know huh, that we didn't know. So that that's the crazy thing. It's like there is something new every day that we were like, wait, we have to do this. We have to do what? This is we have to file this. We have to file that. We have to have this type of registration. We have to have this person uh, as a point of contact for our firm. Are you kidding me? But so like, y'all, I, so did you all do that yourselves, or did you all just let someone kind of run that? No. No, we did it ourselves. So no lawyers. So we were fortunate. No, 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 no. You have to have an attorney. You have to have an attorney. Now you, if you're a fund, you got to have a, you have to have a great attorney. So that was the thing. I built a really great relationship with my attorney, uh, our fund's attorney, uh, through the clubhouse, uh, vehicle that I had. And he not only became a great friend, he became a great mentor. So he literally taught us everything from the ground up. His name is Kevin Vila, Vila Wood. Just such an awesome guy. And he taught us so much. He's literally one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And he would literally sit there in his office and he'd bill us for it, but he would whiteboard <laughs> just things that we need to know, things we need to be doing to build the firm up. And so that was great. But there are so many things with a fund you have to do. You have to create a PPM. You have to create 
an LPAC, a limited partner. PPM, partners. private placement memorandum. Exactly. Yeah, I actually had to uh, read one of those for one of the companies I was looking at for the Baylor Angel Network. Exactly. And, uh, that was a, that was a hundred pages of a lot of fun. Oh, so. that's the, and trust me, it's even worse for a fun man. And, and and then you got you know you got to create a PPM, you got to create an LPAC, you got to create all these things. Like the deck that you create the investment presentation, that's the easiest of all this. It's all the legal stuff. And so Brandon and I, we were like, we can sit here and have Kevin draft all of this. Or we can learn how to write this language ourselves and know how to do it the rest of our lives. Right. So Brandon and I and the rest of the team, we would literally spend days in an office and we had very humble beginnings in the beginning. We were literally in a WeWork. We'd have, we'd spend nights where we'd order pizza or Sean or Brandon or whoever would just go get some honey butter chicken biscuits, just bring it back to the office <laughs> and we'd sit there all night and we'd have it on the big screen. Just, okay, page 76, uh, article this, line this, says this. Why is this an error? And we'd go through that. And that's the type of detail I wanted our firm to have from the beginning. Sure. Because if we can have that attention to detail so early on, then whoever joins our firm in the future, they know what the standard is. Yeah. You know? I, I love the story that you're telling so far because there's a few things that really stand out to me. Um, the first thing, which is you said it a while back was, you know, people think, well, if I start this fund, how am I going to like learn and, you know, just learn from the best, like ask them, Hey, I started a fund and I want to, I want to learn from you. Of course they're going to offer their help. Right. And then the second thing is, you know, you're going through, you, you bring a team around you that is like-minded that has the same aspirations and, um, you sit, you sit, yeah, you sit through the night and, uh, you, you learn a thing or two, right? Exactly. And, man. and there's, and it, it's, it's kind of like what you're talking about with, uh, it's like being back in New York, right? With exactly. The, uh, being at the desk and, uh, just grinding it out. So, um, I, so, you know, I, it seems like you've learned a lot through that process, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, so why do you think people are like, you know, when you, I'm sure you talk to some of your old buddies and you tell them what you're doing now, why do you think as we're talking about just that start of starting a fund, why do you think people are so scared to do that? Yeah, I think people are scared to start anything in general because you don't want to fail. I think there's this idea of comfort that people think they need to have in their life for them to be truly happy and for them to, to reach a certain level of satisfaction and enjoyment in their life. And that prevents them from ever doing anything that you know their heart really truly desires. I think and that, that's some people. Some people are totally fine with, you know, having the traditional uh, job and then leading to roles and leadership down the road. But I think there are so many people that have the potential and have the want and desire to create something, but they're just so scared of falling flat on their face and failing. And I'm like, what do you have to lose right now? For a lot of people our age, you don't have kids. For a lot of people, you know, our age, if you are married, you're super early in your marriage. So, you know, you're still building the foundation. So if you make a lot of mistakes, you don't have kids. So you can make some mistakes. And I just think people are scared to fail. You work so hard in your life growing up. You have the best grades in school, so you can go and, you know, get these awards and you can get these scholarships and you can attend an awesome school like Baylor University. You get to Baylor, you get to Texas, you get to all these phenomenal schools, you get to Princeton, whatever. And then you're there and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, I can't fail anymore. So now I got to make sure I have the best job. So I'm making my family proud. So I'm making the world proud. And, and, and that prevents people from, from doing what their heart truly desires a lot of the time. Uh, and I think that point that I just touched on is super important is that like people care so much about what everybody thinks around them. What are my friends going to say? My friends doing, you know, as a CPA at this firm and then this friend is doing private equity at this firm. If I start my own company, I'm not going to make as much money as them. I'm not, I may fail. And like, what are people going to think of me? You can't care what people think about you. You know, people are going to always have an opinion about you. And that was something my mom always told me. Marcus, you're gonna, people are going to always have an opinion about you. Whether it's good or bad, people are going to have an opinion. So don't care about what people say. Just do it. You know, just do it. Why not? It's pretty simple, right? And yeah, and I'll tell you a funny story. I was at reunions. Princeton has reunions every year. And we were – the way Princeton reunions works is, like, you have all these sites on campus. And, like, you have 30,000 alumni that come back. And, you know, literally every alumni comes back. And it's just a big party. So you see some really, 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 really – prominent alum that come back. Well, one of the unions, one of the guys that came back was none other than Jeff Bezos. Hmm. And so I see Jeff, me and a few buddies see Jeff Bezos at this tent for reunions. And we go, hey, what's the best advice you have for us in building a company or starting a company or just doing something in our careers? He goes, just do it. That's all yeah. he said. He goes, just do funny it. funny because he, he was a banker. Yeah. Right? He was and, a banker. Yeah. Uh, he, he was there for a few, quite a few years, yeah. unlike so, you. But it, you know, I, think, I think you're right. That's the hardest part. Well, the thing about Jeff was he was, I say Jeff, like I know him or something. (laughs) (laughs) 
the thing about him was he was at D.E. Shaw, one of the best hedge funds in the world, for literally a year and a half or two years, not long, or no, it was a little bit longer than that. But even still, he, you know, said to his wife, who was also working at that, that fund, he said, hey, we're just going to do this. Like, let's do this. And they packed up their bags and moved to Seattle. And so he had a little bit of comfort, but he still was in the same boat as us. Why not? Yeah. And so when he said, just do it to us, our group, we were just like, yeah, we're just going to do it. Yeah. So, so, um, there's a few, there's a few things that I hear a lot from people my age that are really scared. So like seniors in colleges are trying to get out. And when, you know, when I suggest the thing of, Hey, why don't you start your own business? Right. Right. One of the things they tell me is, Hey, like this job is going to be great because I'm going to learn a ton. Right. Yeah. So I want to, I want to hear from you, like, you know, from, you know, you started this fun, you know, almost a year, year and a half or not even a few months now. Right. Yeah. And, uh, do you feel like you learn more than when you were at your, um, at your job in New York? I've learned 100 X more doing now what I'm doing now than I did in my job in New York. Is that because you feel like the work that you're doing as an analyst was maybe like nit- nitpicking exactly you know, Excel sheets and stuff. Exactly. And now you feel like you're learning like real life applications. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, it's crazy because now that I'm doing this, like we've started to hire people. We're starting to get analysts. We're starting to do this. And I'm already given the people that we're hiring so much work. I'm like, Hey, listen, you're going to go sit on that panel. I know what it says, Marcus Stroud, but you're going to be the person that goes sit on this panel. And they're like, wait, what? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't go sit on this panel. I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified. I'm like, yes, you are. You got this job. So you're going to go sit on this panel. You're going to talk. You're, you're going to sit there with other investors who are a lot older than you, but you're going to learn and you're going to talk and you're going to build that confidence that you can do this thing because that's the culture you want to create. And I think that so many people think that you have to go to another, and don't get me wrong. I learned a lot at, at, at market access. I learned a lot at Beta Capital. I learned a lot at Clubhouse. I learned a lot about propriety and decorum and just certain ways how to carry yourself in business. But when I started my own fund and I had to write the PPM and I had to go find the deals, I had to create the investment strategy, I had to create the deal sourcing strategy, and I had to sit down with institutional investors, you know, these, these billion dollar asset managers saying, Hey, this is the amount of capital we, we're asking for in our fund for this specific reason. I learned so much, much, much more. Sure. So, and you know, the second thing that I always hear from people is that, you know, I I need to, I want to get a job so that, you know, I can get my, my feet set a little bit and then, you know, I can start, um, you know, maybe I can consider entrepreneurship, which my response is, well, kind of like you said earlier, you know, people get comfortable with that a little bit and all their, you know, they're working with people that are also doing the same thing and it just becomes 10 times harder. Exactly. But, um, they do have a point, you know, financially it is hard to do that. So like, how did you balance it? I mean, you obviously worked at some really good funds, but you know, as you start the fund, right, it becomes very difficult for those, you know, few months and uh, maybe in that year, the first year. Yeah. And so, like, trust me, man, there's a lot of sacrifice involved. And I agree. I think that, like, you know, if you aren't someone that comes from a whole lot of money uh, or you come from a network where people aren't going to necessarily support you, if you're going to business off the ground, then, yeah, you need to get a job. You need to make sense. But sometimes it's not just like a traditional nine to five. You have a company and you want to start it. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I met a guy who started a fund that literally drove Ubers and Uber Eats and did all this other stuff for like a year before he was able to like successfully live off the proceeds from his fund. And that's what it takes. And that's well just, some, yeah. that's just sometimes what it takes. And so, um, for me, I knew I wanted to do this. So I've always lived more or less really frugal. And when I say that, it's like, yeah, you have fun, you do things, but I knew that in my life, I want to do something crazy. So I need to continually be saving a good amount of money. So when it is time for me to do something crazy, I'm not, you know, worrying about how am I going to eat the next day or where am I going to sleep the next day. And so, so you prepared yourself, for this prepared moment. myself big time. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's something I think about a lot. Cause you know, I do have some, some of these aspirations and, you know, yeah. think about, well, if the a moment comes, well, will I be prepared? Yeah. Right. And let's just say I'm prepared mentally, but I'm right. prepared financially. Right. right? And so, uh, building, you know, it's, it starts even before you even start thinking about it in that moment. So, yeah. um, I think that's great advice. So let's switch over to something that I'm really passionate about. And that's pitching. Yeah. And I think pitching is super neat because it's not just pitching a company. You're always pitching yourself. You're pitching, um, yourself as, a, you know, as you, as an investor, I mean, right. as a, you know, a fund manager that's trying to get investors, right. but you also pitch yourself as a leader within your own organization. You pitch yourself to people that you meet all the time. Yeah. So, um, so before we go into some of the specifics, um, I just want to make sure your fund is raising $50 million, right? 
Publicly, we're going to say that, yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's go with that. Um, and so when you, so first of all, that, that number is crazy, right? Like 24 years old, you, you say, I'm going to raise a $50 million fund. The press is out there. Right. Um, you know, everything is looking good. But, you know, when you go to an investor, um, and for the sake of it, let's just imagine an investor is listening to the show because maybe they are, who knows? Um, if you know, if you don't mind sharing, like, what is your pitch? Like, what do you tell them? You're a 24 year old kid. You had a few experiences, but you're, you know, you've got guys that are 50 years old starting funds. Right. right. So what do you tell them? Like, how does that even go? <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. We, I feel like we do this every day. Um, look, we just, we shoot them to them straight. We keep it extremely real. We keep it honest. We keep it genuine. And it's like, Hey, listen, we are a new fund. You know, the average age of a partner in our fund is 24, 25 years old. Uh, and we're doing things a lot differently. Okay. So, you know, number one, we're, we're a fund led by 24, 25 year olds based in Dallas and Austin, Texas. You don't hear that because guess what? Venture capital is not an asset class that's extremely attractive in Dallas and Austin. We're a fund that's investing primarily in between the coast, in Chicago, in Atlanta, in Charlotte. The flyover states. The flyover states. Yeah. Exactly. The flyover states. That's not sexy for a lot of people. You know, why aren't you guys doing the whole Silicon Valley, New York thing? And, you know, some of our portfolio is that, but we're focused on the place that people have traditionally not looked at for venture. And our premise is this. You can continue doing what people have done for so long and get some of the same results. But at some point, the wall is going to become dry. So what are you going to start doing next? You have to change. You know, our world changes constantly. You know, you have a world that more or less over the next five to seven years, the majority consumer population are going to be Generation Z and millennials. And so you have, you see 2019, you have all these incredible IPOs like Lyft and Palantir and Uber and, 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 and just so many awesome companies. You know, you have, you know, Instagram and Airbnb and all these super cool companies that, you know, more or less were shaped or Warby Parker. I'm not saying Warby Parker is public or anything, but you know, Lime, Bird, you have all these companies that were shaped by millennials, by folks that are young. They're literally shaping economies day by day then the folks that are shaping the economy should be the ones that are investing. And the thing that resonated with our first, the first investor we ever talked to, and we won them, it was, a, it was a couple, we won them over within 30 minutes, was this. I said, listen, you can go talk to that fund manager that's 55, 60 years old. Guess what? They have an incredible education. They have a ton of experience investing. They uh, have so many exits and so many portfolio companies. So my question to you is, what do they have to work for? Okay. What, what do they have to work for? They have hundreds of millions of dollars. What do they have to work for? Their principal under them is handling the, the, the associate under them who's handling the analyst under them. And the analyst is doing the grunt work. And by the time it gets to the, the partner, you know, the deal's pretty much already done. They're just writing the check. So y- y- you don't like this partner is convincing you to get the money, but guess what? More than likely, he doesn't know the amount of deal flow that you're seeing. Then you have us. You have three 24 year olds who literally are on the road every single week in sometimes three, sometimes four cities a week looking for the best entrepreneurs. I've done the Texas Triangle in a day probably six times. I woke up in Austin. I had lunch in Dallas. I had dinner in Houston. I've done that literally three to- or six times. And it's like, do you want the people that are hustling for the best deals? Do you want the people that are literally experiencing the best deals are utilizing the products that are creating the best deal flow or do you want the people that more or less are unattached and don't really have as much of a motivation to do this and i'll tell you a story the the story that has resonated with every investor that has got them from a point of hmm i don't know if i want to do this to okay i'm definitely doing this so we were coming back from san francisco for a really cool conference that we were invited to and our flight to austin got canceled but we need to be in Austin at 9 a.m. the next morning. So we end up going to Dallas. And we're looking at each other like, how are we going to get to Austin? It's literally 1.30 in the morning. We can get a rental car and drive up. But we all need to sleep a little bit. And honestly, like, we we just, we need to get, we need to get there. So we get on a Greyhound at 3.38 a.m. I remember the exact time. And we get to Austin at 6.38. We sleep for literally about 30, 45 minutes apiece. We wake up, we shower and we'll have the meeting the next morning. All to meet with this person, with this really cool entrepreneur that we wanted an allocation in his deal. And 
that has resonated with so many investors, with so many people, because that's the level of sacrifice. That's the level of hunger that we're willing to do that a lot of investors just quite frankly aren't. So yeah. I know that's a long pitch, but that's generally no, how the pitch no. goes. Marcus, that's a, that's, that's a great pitch. Uh, yeah. you're kind of, I'm sitting here listening going, man, I need to join these guys. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, let me know if you're ever doing any biotech. Yeah, I want to just come in sure, on it. <laughs> for sure, man. Um, so one thing I've learned in uh, being a part of the angel network is that it really matters who your investors are. Um, you know, it's nice right now to take in money, but later on, they're going to be the ones that ask, going to be asking you, Hey, what happened with my money? Right? right. And some people are just a little more aggressive with it. And you're trying to do, you're trying to, you know, take care of all your deals and it could become a very dicey situation. So, um, you know, how do you pick investors? Yeah. So there is a such thing as called smart money and, you know, startups when they're looking for investors, this is like the biggest thing that hurts a lot of startups is they don't really get smart money. They're just so desperate for capital. They just taking money from whoever is wanting to write a check. And that sometimes ends up hurting the company because then your, your board gets jacked up and, you know, the incentives of the company aren't aligned with investors. And unfortunately, nine times out of 10, the investors are going to win because it's their money that's running the company. Um, and so for us, it was the same thing. It was like, we have to make sure the capital that we're receiving is smart capital, people that believe in our vision and people that understand that venture is a risky long-term game. And so that's more or less, I guess, how we approach investors and how we look at each person we talk to. Because there were many times in the beginning where people were like, oh, I know this this wealthy person or this family office or this, they'd be good for you guys. And then you do some research on it and you see that they have destroyed, you know, vocally you know, companies within this particular sector. And that's a sector that we like a lot. So they would not be a good investor because they would dispute every investment we make in that particular sector. And so we're just very, very cognizant and mindful of each investor we talk to and each investor that we let into the fund. You know, one of the questions that I got was actually from a former Alabama football player. Okay. And he said, um, how do you leverage your ex football contacts while you're raising money or just being in the VC world? Yeah. And, it, and once again, it goes back. I guess, I guess it depends on the context. So, you know, as far as I know, a lot of people think like, oh, Marcus, I know you played college football and like, listen, Prince is not turning out NFL players every year. So that's not where your value in Prince football comes from, but <laughs> like in Alabama or Baylor. But, um, you know, I grew up around a lot of football players and just I grew up around a lot of guys who are in the NFL right now. And it's, it's, it, it could be very easy to just call them and say, Hey, I have a fun, put some money in it. But like that, wouldn't be smart. And so what we did initially was we know a lot of athletes have interest in investing in really cool companies, but you know, they don't really know how to. And so we partnered with a few groups, had little seminars where we talked about kind of the life cycle of a startup, the risk of investing in a startup and how you should invest. Like teaching them. Exactly. And so we created this co-investment vehicle that allowed athletes to invest this is back at the clubhouse. No, this is even part two XV. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. so we have a co-investment vehicle. It's it's honestly for anybody, but it's kind of on the side to. Yeah, it's on. part of the fund. I mean, and every fund has a co-investment vehicle for the right people. Right. So every single fund has a co-investment vehicle, uh, but the co-investment vehicle that we have has a lot of athletes that participate in it. So it's like we get a deal. We'll say, hey, this this vehicle, we're going to give you guys seventy five thousand dollars between your group. If you guys want to come in in small checks, so you'll see checks anywhere from like 5,000 to 15 or 25 or 30, sometimes even the full, the full, whatever amount. But I think that's been the best way to leverage it. It's like, Hey, there's a career after football. Let me help you think about, think about it as you're preparing for the next step of your life. So I think it's a good time to uh, transition into something that is pretty, f- it's a fun part of the segment. Not that yeah. the, the other parts aren't, but it's something I really look forward to. It's called the hot seat. So okay. I'm going to put you on the hot seat. All right, man. Just random questions. For and, sure. Um, uh, they're, they're probably not going to be things you're going to be expecting. So, okay, cool. Um, all right. So it's been a long day, right? Yeah. Uh, you need to get a song to get you going, right? Yeah. What are you picking out of your playlist? Hell's Bells, ACDC. Oh man, that was you're easy. old school. That's easy. I love classic rock, man. <laughs> Goes back to my football days. Hell's See, bells. You, you would fit. This is how you fit. Just fine at Princeton. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I'm old school, my man. Uh, so so now you're you're done with football, right? Right. So, um, what does working out look like now? I work out at a 
body, this, this thing called Dane's Body Shop. It's a gym in Austin. I wake up every morning at 5.30 a.m., Monday through Friday, Wednesday mornings at 6. I play basketball at the Y, so I don't work out on Wednesday, but Monday through Friday, outside of Wednesday, I'm working out 5.30 this in the morning. like if you're not in the area, or if, if you are, if you're, I mean, if you're not in the area, you're probably Yeah, not, exactly. Right? If I'm on the road, then I will find a gym in that city, and I just take advantage of the day memberships all the time. And so you it. You're, talk, you're saying you pay 10 bucks to go work out, or you... Yeah, uh, sometimes it's ten, sometimes it's free. It's like okay, you have to walk around the gym and do this and that, but you still get a chance to work out for free. So I love that. Yeah. What's the most underrated app that you've used? <laughs> What's the most underrated app that I've used? That's such a good question. Let me just look at my phone really quick because I know there's a million apps that I look at uh, that I, that I use a lot that I don't realize. Oh, Google Task, the best app ever. Google Task. Yeah. So what is that? So it's just literally an app for you to put like tasks that you need to get done. You it's just like a to do list. Exactly to do list, and it's just been a game changer in my life. And so how's that different from uh, me just like having a notes tab that says to do list and noting it all down? You can do that, but there's a lot of things I can schedule. Like I can sync my like Gmail calendar with my Google Task list, saying, "Okay, I have a meeting with this investor. Let me make sure that I, you know." study this before talking to them. And it's like, okay, Marcus, you're meeting this investor at 2 PM. Make sure you remember to study. And it, and it reminds you. And it's cool because like the same con, the same alerts I get for that event in Google calendar, I get the same alerts on my task list. So sure. it's just super freaking awesome. Okay. Yeah. I'll check that out myself. Um, do you have any morning rituals? Uh, like I said, I wake up super early, five thirty, work out. And then I pray, pray a lot. Morning time is kind of my quiet time. And, you know, people aren't really emailing you. People aren't like asking you for something. <laughs> and so the morning time for me is literally just praying and working out and just meditating. Hmm. Uh, meditating, like actually yeah. meditating. Like just literally just sitting, just sitting in silence and just truly taking in, you know, whatever I'm praying about or whatever scripture I'm reading uh, is giving me. So, so um, let's say you wake up, you said five fifteen. Mm-hmm. So like, what, what is like, how do you, how would you break that? Like, yeah. So we go with five fifteen, and what I've tried to do better is, you know, everybody wakes up in the morning and they get on Instagram and they feed on Facebook and then they go back to Instagram and they sometimes go to Facebook and you check your email and then you get out of bed, you get going. I literally wake up. I just instantly just wake up, wake up a little bit, kind of shake my head, just get going. And, uh, I wake up to like my Google song is my Google home. The, the song that plays as my alarm is Hell's Bells. So I'm waking up <laughs> to the one that pumps you up. Yeah, exactly. So you're gonna, and I'm fired up, but I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm just going to say my prayer. I'm going to thank you really quickly. Not quick, quickly, but I'm going to, I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to think about everything I want to accomplish today. I'm going to think about the person that I want to be today. Cause you know, man, life is hard. Sometimes you got to tell yourself, I want to make sure that I am actively thinking about being a good person. Cause there are days where you don't want to be a good person. You want to be just kind of selfish, but yeah. So that's what I'm wondering. It's like, wake up, get out of bed, get the dust off my eyes, get going, shower, pray, just keep going. So that's like a 15, 20 minute routine. Exactly. Sometimes in 30, 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. Sure. And how long does, what does meditation look like or how long does that, uh, it depends, man. It depends. Sometimes in the morning you just get carried away in scripture and the word. And so sometimes it can be a 15 minute, sometimes it can be a five minute, sometimes it can be an hour. And all of a sudden, you know, you're taking the 630 workout instead of the 530 workout or the 730 workout instead of the 630 workout. And so it just depends. Sure. And just sitting there, I have a, uh, my roommate now, my roommate now, we have a really cool area in our apartment where, um, we just like, we both go and we both just sit there and we just read and we drink coffee and we just pray and we just think. And, uh, it's, it's super awesome. Yeah. Um, meditation is something that, uh, I'm a big fan of and I try, you know, it's funny because I have all these people on the show and I had one person who was a former congressman that, you know, wanted to talk about meditation and that was his whole spiel. But, you know, I, I'm recording these episodes and I'm like, Oh, what does your morning look like? And, and I'm really surprised whenever I hear meditation from people I didn't know was as popular as it, as it is, oh, yeah. you know? Um, my, my whole thing is that we have such a big monkey brain that we just don't control. And how do we can, the only way that I've found to like control that is to use meditation. Exactly. Um, and I, and then, you know, just being a medical guy, I did this whole concept of the unconscious really fascinates me. Right. And like, right. what do you do? Like, I feel like we're on our phones, we're all this stuff and like what's happening in that unconscious. We don't know. Right. right. But the only way to, you know, really tap into it is to really consciously think is, in, 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 in such a positive light or, um, at least a, 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 as a start to slow down that process, right? exactly. that monkey brain. So you right. can even do some of this conscious stuff. Exactly. Influence the unconscious. And 
Hey, now I'm just starting to sound like a hippie, but <laughs> no, dude, no, I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, I learned about meditating from, uh, you know, one of my really good friends in college and I am in my head. I, when I heard the word meditation, I just had all these other thoughts like, wait, I, I, I don't meditate. I just pray. And then you realize like, listen, man, meditation can take many, many forms from many different people, from many different walks of life. And so for me, uh, when I was able to define my own form of meditation, which literally just meant me sitting there, just being still and just, and just having peace and knowing that what I'm reading is true, what I'm reading is real, what I'm thinking and praying is real. That, that, that was great meditation for me and it is great meditation for me. So, yeah. So, um, Marcus, you're, you're a 25 year old guy now. Yeah. You, you know, you're, you're planning to raise a $50 million fund. Yep. Um, you know, this is something that, some people in Wall Street that have worked 30, 40 years dream yep. about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when I think of you, one thing I think of is to whom much is given, much is expected. Yeah. Right. And I know, you know, as you're talking about what, you know, the way you t- describe the hustle that you have, you automatically have a little bit of pressure on you. Right. Yep. Um, but how do you balance that? Like, you know, do you ever like worry? Like, what does that look like for you? Um, you yeah. Know, when, and if that, you know, those thoughts come up, I'm sure. And so what do you do when that happens? Yeah, so it's very easy to sit there and say, you, know, you said it earlier, it's like, wow, we've gotten all this press from some of the biggest publications in the world. Wow, we're meeting with all these great investors. Like, we have to raise this fund. And not only do we not have to raise this fund, we have to successfully deploy this capital. And not only do we have to successfully deploy the capital, we have to have phenomenal returns and phenomenal investments. And so it's so easy to get caught up in that. It's so easy to think. But then you realize, it goes back to what I said to you earlier, it's like, where is my pressure coming from? It's coming from my thoughts of other people. Right. It's coming from my, my thoughts of the world. And when I just step back and I recognize that, hey, I'm not running the race for anybody else but myself. And, and I'm doing this for ultimately, you know, God's glory. That helps me have so much peace because because I have that mindset, and because I know ultimately in my heart that it's for him. That's when I know these things are going to work out. It's going to be successful. And it's going to be successful in his way. It may not necessarily be my way. Sure. And I've seen it so far in that, like, okay, we thought we were going to raise this size fund. And we thought that these people were going to be the anchor investors. And when those things didn't happen, I got really down. I was like, man, this sucks. Like, because we've had a lot of failures and we've had a lot of ups and downs in this yeah. fund. But it's like the minute I got down on that thing, I just started praying, praying, and just thinking, just saying, okay, I, I trust in you, I trust in you. And it's like literally weeks later, we get an even better anchor investor, like one of the world's most foremost like funds to literally invest in us. And then we get, you know, we end up having a bigger fund. And so it went from being this fund to now, you know, you hear 50 and that's the number that you hear right now. But like I said, that's what we're saying publicly uh, to, <laughs> to something even crazier. And it's like. You never would have thought, right? You never yeah. would have thought. And you just yeah. got to stay the race, man. And you can't just let, you can't let what you hear. You think about like LeBron James and Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan and Tom Brady. Everybody was telling, telling Tom Brady this year, hey, Tom, this is your last year. You guys are going to make the Super Bowl. You're old. And the Patriots had, you know, beginning of the season, they had this drop off where they weren't that good. And people were like, oh, this is the, this is the Patriots year. They're done. They're not winning any more Super Bowls. Tom Brady's done. And you literally hear all these analysts saying he sucks on like ESPN. What happens come come January or February, or whatever? He's a Super Bowl champion, <laughs> and it's because he said, "I don't care what people have to say. I'm just going to run my race." Right. And that's that's how I tell my team. That's what I tell myself. That's what I tell my friends who struggle in life. Just run your race. Don't worry about anybody else. Sure. And that's so simple, but so powerful at the yeah. same time. So you mentioned failures, and that's something I want to get into because. Earlier, we were talking about one of my close friends and mentors, um, and uh, one of the things that he's told me and he sent me was, um, you know, I, I was talking to him. I was like, man, you're so successful, this, this, and this. And he sent me a cartoon, a cartoon of this guy that was kind of puffed up and looked yeah. big, and everyone looked at him and just kind of everyone was just like appalled. But in reality, all, all of that, um, you know, what, what made him who he was was all these failures just added up, and you know, just and you could in the cartoon that kind of built up into the person he was. Um, and I just thought it was a great replica of what failure really is and what life right. is about, right? It's like right. all your failures are the ones that make you who you are. And no one sees that. Right. All they see is this like perfect replica. They see $50 million and they see Marcus Stroud next to that, right? right. Um, and they see your partners. But 
I, one of the things I've actually struggled on this podcast, I haven't asked people about their failures. And I think that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning about more. Um, and so I was going to ask you, you know, what are some things that, um, maybe you failed at that you'd like to share, or maybe some things that, um, even recently, as you kind of mentioned, you know, this just don't go your way. What do you do in that situation? Yeah. So like, I mean, when we first started the fund and we had our first pitch deck, there were so many things that we had put in that deck that we didn't realize was either not needed or wasn't like good information to put in the deck. And so like, you know, our first meeting, we got a yes from an investor in our very first meeting. We thought that's exactly how this thing is going to go. We're going to get yeses everywhere we go. We're going to be the fastest fundraise ever. We're literally going to be those, those people. And it's like the next like seven or eight meetings was just, you guys suck. You guys suck. You guys didn't do this. You guys didn't do that. Your, your investment thesis is stupid. And you're realizing that, you know, there, you just haven't done enough homework in certain things of your firm. And so that sucked. That was really, really hard. And that was tough. And. You know, you recognize that, you know, you learn a lot about yourself when you do something crazy like building a fund. And so you see some truly ugly sides to you sometimes when, you know, things might necessarily go your way. And, you know, you have to be humbled by those times and recognize that, wow, I got to be better. And so I remember one day, like, I'm a, I, I, like, you know, you were talking to Brandon earlier. I'm all gas, no brakes. I'm just all gas. Like, go, 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 go. And his analogy of the car thing is perfect. I'm driving the car. He has the map. And then like the rest of our team in the backseat, they're like helping Brandon with the map. And I'm just driving the car. And I'm just like, gas, 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 gas. And Brandon and the rest of the team are like, Marcus, brake, turn, turn. I'm like, no, we're going to get there going 100 miles per hour. And that sometimes leads to failures. And sometimes that leads to, you know, outbursts. And that leads to arguments on our team. And you recognize that number one, not only did I fail myself, but I felt them today because I didn't react in a great way or, or I didn't do enough homework and I, my pride got the best of me. And so the best way to handle those things is number one, just have humility and knowing that you can't be all things, all people knowing that you don't know everything and knowing that, Hey, there's an inc- incredible thing called grace that's out there for you. Um, and when I learned those things and when I experienced those things, it helped me have peace about my failures because I know that there is grace and mercy out there for me when I'm not the nicest person, when I don't understand things, when I'm maybe rude to one of my, 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 my colleagues, there's grace out there. And I have enough humility as a result of that grace and that mercy to go to them and say, I'm so sorry. You know what? Like you were right. How about you lead this project? How about you be the board member? How about you be the point of contact? I'm just going to take a backseat to you because you're actually better than me. Yeah. And so failures have led to great things for our team. Sure. What about even before the fund? Are there any like failures that come to mind that has really shaped you? Oh yeah, man. Like I, <laughs> or let I, me ask you this before you answer that. Marcus. Yeah. Like do, when you think of your life, do you think of your life as an accumulation of failures that have led to where you are? No, I think of my life as an accumulation of steps that have led to me where I am at. And so I think of my life in the sense that there were just, certain events in my life that took place that wasn't a failure, but was just an opportunity for me to learn and become even better. Got it. So you I mean, even label as a failure from no, the get go and that no, helped shape your, no. got it. like I'll say the clubhouse, I don't think the clubhouse, I don't think was that successful. I think we could have done so much more with the clubhouse. A lot of people believe that, but the clubhouse and the failures of not the failures of the clubhouse, but the, the shortcomings of the clubhouse led to the great thing that TXV is today. And I wouldn't know what I know about TXV if it had been for the shortcomings of the clubhouse. So, sure. um, and I want to leave time in, uh, as we kind of wrap up the, the session is you mentioned your, the power of role models in your own life. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just want to let you kind of explain that and what, what that means to you and yeah. how, how, who are these role models that you've had? Right. So I think for anybody, what I've told my two younger brothers is find a role model in your life find a role model in your career, in your industry, and like, like, like hold on to them, learn from them, follow them on LinkedIn, follow them on Instagram, hell, add them on Facebook if you can. I, like, do it, do it, learn from them, absorb from them. Because if you see their day to day life and you, you see that's something you want to do, you get to get a first hand experience at that. And so for me, college, I looked out and I said, okay, who are the investors I want to talk to? Okay, cool. I, I follow them on LinkedIn. I, I talk to them. And, you know, I learned from them. And 
I think in my life, I've been very, very fortunate in that, like, because I've been naive, because I've asked a lot of questions, because I've been very, very straightforward with people saying, I want you to be my mentor. I've had some incredible people. The role model in my life I look up to the most, I would say, is a guy named Brent Jones. So Brent was a four-time pro bowler for the San Francisco 49ers, played back with Joe Montana, Steve Young, and they won all those Super Bowls. And was like, you know, four-time all pro as well. So he's literally one of the best tight ends of all time in the NFL history. But from there, he went on and raised a $4.4 billion fund of funds called Northgate Capital. So here's this NFL superstar, you know, who just won three Super Bowls and is like a king in San Francisco. And he can stop there. But Brent said no. And I've heard this story from other NFL players that played with Brent, who said Brent was that guy who was at the airport. He's a superstar tight end walking around with Forbes magazine saying, how do I, what do I do about venture? And it's crazy because I had lunch with Brent today. And every time I see him and talk to him, I'm just like, I'm so inspired by you. Because him and his fellow teammate who started the fund, these are these two NFL superstars who are driving around the country, raising capital, who are asking all these questions, who are literally being laughed at and mocked at in rooms with some of the best investors in the world saying, you don't deserve to be in our world. What are you doing? You're just an NFL player. And this is a guy that overcame those shortcomings and said, I don't care what you said to me. I'm going to start this fund. And raised $4.4 billion. It is arguably the most successful NFL player post NFL in the history of the NFL. And, and even before his fund, I mean, this is a guy who went to a D2 school that cut their football program raised like, you know, about 10, 15 years ago and got in a car accident and was literally cut from the first team he joined and said, even though I'm number seven on the depth chart for the 49ers, I'm going to work my butt off and becomes one of the best tight ends in it. 49 history. And so that's my role model. And I have a ton of role models. Tory Hunter. I mean, I, I can't say enough things about Tory Hunter. Uh, you know, that literally is the best person ever. Uh, my mom, you know, just the sacrifice that woman made. And, and then my high school counselors and my English teacher. I wouldn't be a Princeton if it wasn't for those two women who literally, you know, sat in the library with me and said, we're going to go through your subject tests. We're going to see where you didn't do well at. And we're going to improve on that. You know, we're going to go through you know, this AP test that's going to give you some credit at Princeton. Those are my role models. Those are the people that inspire me and make me want to work hard every day because they sacrifice for me, you know, and Brent's like the role model I have because I want to get to where he's at. Yeah. Seems like each one of those people have uh, impacted your life. In oh, man. Way. I just, I mean, you, you ask anybody that knows me, I could talk about Brent for hours. And so. so let's talk about Brent a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, so Mr. Jones, like when you, when you reached out to him, how did that process look? You know, dude, it's really crazy how that happened, just how life is in general. So I, when I was running the clubhouse, I was looking for athletes that a lot of these super athletes could, could relate to. I'm like, which athlete out there is a super awesome athlete investor or athlete turned investor that a lot of these athletes in the clubhouse can learn from? So I'm going on like Forbes and I'm Googling it and the same names keep popping up. Brent Jones, Tommy Vardell. Brent Jones, Tommy Vardell. And then you'd have all these articles with Kobe Bryant and Steph Curry and Kevin Durant, but it looked like they were just following trends. But Brent Jones and Tommy Bardell were the names every, that I kept seeing everywhere. So I added like somebody who was like connected to them on LinkedIn, and that person was like, oh, I don't really know him that well. So, okay, I couldn't get that introduction. Then I added somebody else on LinkedIn who knew them, and they said, yeah, I'm not going to make that introduction for you. I'm sorry. Like, I just, I'm not going to do that. I'm, like, Did he feel like, you know, he just, he said, you weren't, he, he said, you weren't ready. You're like, wow. you don't deserve to talk to this, this guy. He said that quote unquote. He was like, listen, no offense, man, but like, what do you have to talk to Brent about? Like, yeah. you know, what do you have to talk to Tommy about? Like, you're just a kid. Like, well, you don't need to talk to them. And I was just, I had given up. I was like, I'm not going to see Brent. So I get introduced to Brent. So I, it's crazy. I meet this guy named Steve Wisniewski through a close friend of mine. And Steve was another, you know, legendary NFL player, eight time pro bowler. And Steve is a serial angel investor, has done hundreds of investments. So Steve and I hit it off really well. We've become close. One day, Steve and I are at a restaurant just having dinner and talking. And he goes, hey, man, I'm going to introduce you to my really close friend. And I go, who's that? He goes, Brent Jones. Your and I go, just, uh, yeah. you're joking. <laughs> he goes, Marcus, Brent's my like best friend. He's the one who taught me about venture. He's the guy that got me investing. He's literally one of the smartest people I know. And guess what? He lives right down the street in South Lake. I'm like, Brent Jones lives in South Lake, Texas? Are you kidding me? And so he introduces us via text, and then Brent goes, hey, man, can you get breakfast tomorrow morning? And I'm like, of course I can. 
And next thing you know, I'm literally sitting with Brent at breakfast, and he's telling me these legendary stories about him and Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and Steve Young and how all these guys went to go start a fund and how he started a fund. And then Joe Montana and them started a fund over here and how they learned from each other. You know, he got to where he is now. And I'm just sitting there like, man, if you just have a little bit of patience, you just trust the process, you never know where life can take you. And it just so happened that it took me right to Brent that yeah. morning. So, And here you are. And here I am. Wow. Well, uh, Marcus, um, there is so much more I could talk to you about. But yeah. um, I know you got to get going. And this has been such a pleasure. And I know that a ton of people are really going to learn from this. Uh, you, have, you bring such, you know, such a great amount of energy. And um, I can't wait to see what you do. So, Marcus, thanks for being here today. Hey, Yash, man. I appreciate it, man. I'm really excited to see what you're doing and continue what you're doing, man. You... You're going to change the lives of a lot of people by doing this, man. I wish I would have given anything to have somebody like you in my network at Princeton. I would have given anything to have, like, to have a podcast like this at Princeton. Uh, you know, this is just so incredible, man. So thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Anytime, man. Anytime. So if you like what you heard so far, go ahead and click subscribe to stay up to date on the Yash & Company podcast. And do make sure to let me know of any thoughts or comments that you might have, and maybe even any suggestions on who to invite to the show next. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, this is Yash signing out.